and uh, Revit. And this is on the heels of a release that we made about a month ago uh, that was our 2.0 release. And uh, it has the capabilities to join a meeting together um, in virtual reality using Revit. So we'll walk you guys through the steps uh, to go through that process and um, talk about some of the best practices. I'm going to start by talking about some high-level uh, value of VR, what we've seen in the industry, where we see VR heading a little bit. Um, and then we'll dive into uh, VR specifically with Revit, some uh, tricks that we use for optimizing the file before going into VR, um, common VR workflows that we've seen uh, that our users are doing right now. And then um, we will have a collaboration session. We have our booth. Um, uh, two employees there are going to join us um, from there, and we'll walk through with them. And you guys can see uh, the meeting happening across, across time and space. And then, of course, we'll do questions and answers. So my background, I'm uh, the CEO and founder of Iris VR. I come from architecture. I went to the dark side of technology about four years ago. Um, and uh, we started the company focusing on how we could really make VR accessible to AEC workflows. Specifically, we've been focusing on uh, Revit, Rhino, and SketchUp, how we can get a lot of that 3D data into VR very quickly, really make it a seamless process. And um, I come from a rendering background and a modeling background, so um, I'm on the team bringing a lot of the, the product-oriented uh, vision and um, a lot of the 3D work into VR. Uh, and my educational background, ooh, that's interesting, <laughs> uh, is actually in uh, economics. Um, but I joined Iris about a year ago on the customer experience team, so I work with a lot of our customers on um, you know, workflows and really making sure that they're getting value out of um, you know, their VR software. And if you write to support at irisvr.com or info at irisvr.com or help at irisvr.com, those all go to Harry right now. So he's the, he's the response. And so uh, at Iris, we are um, about uh, 25 people now. We're based in New York City. Um, we have two software products. We're talking today about Prospect. We also have a mobile product that works with mobile devices. Um, and we are focusing on how we can make VR really accessible for all of these workflows. And we started working in VR back in the day because, um, first, it's a true-to-scale experience. Any of you that have tried VR, it sounds like most people in this room have been in VR a couple times. Um, the sense of scale is something that you just don't get in other, any other medium. And uh, it's something that's very important if you're working on a building before it's built. And um, from that, that true-to-scale value, we're seeing that um, it can help build trust with clients. You can get a lot of buy-in with um, customers. It can help uh, speed up the approval process, communicate design intent. Um, and one thing that we're seeing more recently is it's really helping in the QA, QC process, especially around um, verifying and validating uh, the modeling process. And especially if someone's making a messy model, being able to walk through and uh, be like this and this and this is wrong and do a really visual QA, QC pass on it. Um, and then what we're talking about now is also communicating across teams and across different project stakeholders. So now that you can do all of this in VR, why not bring other parts of your team into that experience and start having these conversations as you're immersed um, with different parts of your team? And the end result, of course, is saving costs, saving time, increasing communication, and better visualizi visualizing your project and being able to walk through the space true to scale. So for that sort of for VR in general, for us specifically, we focused a lot on how we can make this easy. There's a lot of great tools out there that um, give you a lot more fine-grained control of the experience, but they're very technical. Um, a lot of our approach has been, um, as VR starts expanding beyond just the tech leaders at firms, how can people that are just day-to-day -day in Revit, day-to-day -day in Rhino, begin to use this in a really accessible way and not feel like it's removed from their workflow? So fo focusing on ease of use, both on the workflow side, but also on the in-VR experience. Um, is a lot of what we're doing day to day and testing with customers. Uh, that comes from our native 3D file support. You'll see this with Revit as we do this walkthrough. Um, we are pulling in more than just the geometry. We're getting a lot of the metadata. We're getting um, a lot of the organization of the file, the way you structure your families, the way you structure your components, um, the way you structure all your layers. We're trying to pull all of that as much as possible into VR so that you really feel like you're in your modeling environment when you go from one of these modeling tools into virtual reality. Um, and comfort is king. Anyone that's tried VR usually has an experience where they got pretty sick, <laughs> and that's bad. You don't want your clients to get sick in VR. They'll associate that with the project. That's no good. Um, so a lot of the work we're doing is how do we make this always performant, even with large files, and then also when you're inside the experience, 
on what are the locomotion best practices, what are the interface best practices that will keep people feeling grounded in the space and uh, not sick. And then now, um, with the recent release, also talking a lot more about collaboration. And now that people are able to share in this experience in VR, what are the new interface challenges? Um, if you're suddenly able to have a couple people in VR with you, how do you guide them through the space? How do you make sure they don't wander off? Uh, how do you make sure that they're listening to you? And um, all of the associated interface challenges with that we're starting to tackle and figure out what an actual in VR meeting looks like long term. And we won't be here without a lot of our early partners. Um, we put some logos up here, but we, we've had most of our early customers are with us through beta that we were in a very early development stage from 2014 through pretty much 2017 and the last year have come to market and have been starting to distribute this technology. So um, a lot of architecture and construction firms have been engaging with us since the beginning and helping us develop this tool. So we're going to walk through Prospect. This is, um, uh, we're going to showcase something that is available with a 45 day free trial. We're going to talk through some other tiers as well that um, we have a viewer tier that is free and then we have a couple others as well, but we'll show you guys the trial tier that you can get from irisvr.com slash prospect. And uh, we'll show you the full workflow through that. And um, for this specific walkthrough, I'm going to talk about how we can optimize this file for VR. So we'll go through that in Revit. Um, setting up a narrative. This is something that we see a lot with client interface and with design review, is how do you actually start sequencing uh, the VR experience so someone can experience the narrative that you've planned um, while they're in VR. Um, how you can import those settings into our technology, and then what features are available to you once you're in VR for both your own personal work and for multi-user functionality. We'll also cover some uh, tips and tricks that we found along the way. All right, so like I said before, comfort matters. Um, this comes down a lot to your graphics card. A lot of you probably know this, but we're running this machine. It has a, 1080 T, a, a GTX 1080 in it which um, is from NVIDIA. Uh, I, I never thought I'd talk about GPUs so much and use <laughs> acronyms and, and four-digit <laughs> words, but we are talking quite a lot about GPUs these days because um, that really decides how performant the experience will be in VR, and it really drives the real-time experience. Um, so starting with the GPU, what matters also is the complexity of your file. We're doing a lot behind the scenes, and you'll see this in our engine. We're doing a lot to optimize this on the fly, and we do a pretty good job, but if you have a massive file that is starting to bog down in Revit and is having a hard time running on your own machine, we're likely going to have a hard time loading it into VR as well. Um, we, can, we can do it quickly, but there's, there's not too much magic behind the scenes once you get to some really messy geometry. So we can talk a bit about optimizing that view. Um, and also optimizing the models and the families that you've imported and how you can uh, detect issues before you're in VR. And then a very important one is testing and retesting. Um, we oftentimes hear of uh, VR being sort of used for the first time in front of the client. Highly recommend trying it first <laughs> and doing a couple trial runs as you prepare for meetings, as you prepare for walkthroughs and um, ways to test those experiences. So we'll start on the optimization side. Um, when we install Prospect, this is what the desktop app looks like. So this will install locally on your machine. This isn't um, a cloud-based tool at this point. Um, there are some, there are some web-based elements with the multi-user tech that we'll get into, um, but this exists on your desktop. And when it installs, it puts in a plugin in Revit. It also puts in a plugin in uh, Rhino and SketchUp right now where um, you can go immediately into VR. Before you go here, though, I'll show you some steps that we go through um, when we're setting up these experiences. So the first big one, and this is one that's accessible if you really want to go into optimizing for frame rate, is um, going through 3ds Max to detect uh, face complexity of these, these objects. There are other open source ways to do it that I won't get into, but you can export this file, bring it into Blender, and also start sorting by components. Um, I'll show you the 3ds Max workflow, though. So here we are in uh, Max. This might be a workflow that some of you are familiar with. Um, this is essentially linking the model. You'll see it's in my links here. I have the Revit file linked. Um, and then I can go into, I use Max primarily <laughs> just for this purpose right now as we are uh, as we're developing in Revit. But I can go into Max, go to this list view right here. And um, by default, you'll just get the breakdown of your families and your components. Um, uh, just by name, and um, the trick that we have and that we've seen a lot of people use is if you right click on this um, sorting bar, you can go to configure columns, 
and this will um, give you a list of uh, data that you can sort by. We have selected faces here, uh, so it won't show up in this list because I've already selected it, but once you have faces selected, um, you can refresh this window, and then you get essentially a breakdown of polygon complexity per family uh, in your Revit model. This is really helpful if you're trying to figure out what's really causing your experience in VR to bog down. You can sort this by descending order and get a list of what the troublemakers are. And the number of times we have customers send us files and it's like one car that was imported by an intern or like some shrubbery made in, in Revit that's fully, ge fully geometric. Usually there's a couple problem families that you can either uh, remodel or you can remove from the experience and it will totally optimize it. So I'll select uh, these three up top because they seem significantly bigger than the others. I'll click OK. And then in 3ds Max, I can right click and isolate this view. Um, and then these are the ones in the file that are much higher density of geometry than everything else. And uh, this is a good example because if you guys know the Revit sample file, which probably a lot of you do, uh, you rarely look at these water towers. And if you're um, going through VR, you might not need this in your walkthrough. So if, this, if these were design elements that weren't necessary for the client experience, this would be a great example of something that you could turn off before going into Revit and then have a more streamlined experience because you have fewer polygons in there. Um, so I will do that actually for this demo. We'll turn this off. Um, and this is just an example of something that you could do that would really, that would really auto automate this. Um, all right, so then once you're in Revit as well, before you click that View in VR button, um, to prepare for a narrative experience, we import all perspective cameras that you have from Revit. Um, so uh, before you click that Send button, you want to make sure that you have sort of a nice setup for your perspective views, because um, these are the ones that will load into VR. So uh, a best practice that we've seen quite often is um, in rendering, of course, you want to put the camera right in the corner. Often you want to put the camera right in the corner of the room. Um, that's going to give you the best results. In VR, it's kind of the opposite. Uh, this is an example in the living room. Um, if we show this camera, this camera defaults to be like right up against this wall because if you want a nice shot of the room, you're going to be pushed up against that wall for a rendering. In VR, you really want to make sure you have space all around the player. So as you start setting up these perspective cameras, put them either in the center of the room or in a place with some movement because um, that way when you bring a client or another user to that space, they'll feel like they'll actually have some leg room and some movement um, and it'll prevent them from feeling really claustrophobic. So with all the cameras in uh, this environment, we've set them up so that they're a little bit more removed from the walls. Uh, they're named properly. They're a little clearer. We've added a few more for like the, uh, the bedroom here just to start adding essentially a room walkthrough that we can use. And then probably most importantly, especially with large files, is um, VR really is the most um, uh, performant when geometry is under control. And I think for things like a hospital wing or um, an airport or anything that's really spanning a lot of uh, <laughs> space, the square footage, um, it does help to set up a section box for the area that you want to specifically review. Um, you can uh, load in entire files. It will make the processing a bit longer. Um, but we have found that for the client experience and for um, any sort of collaboration session, being able to keep folks focused on just a certain area and a scope of work is um, is really beneficial to making the meeting go smoothly. Yes? Yeah, so all this is within Revit. Mm -hmm. Correct. So yeah, this is, um, I just have my, select my camera. I just have my section box set up here and have that turned on. Um, and this, you know, just to show that we're not faking this, I'll crop this a bit more. And you'll see when we bring this into VR, it'll, it'll load just this, this sectioned area. Um, and we also, this is view-based, so I, I have set up a VR view. And we see this with a lot of our customers. They'll have a, sort of either a VR uh, subfolder or a VR section where they just name everything, you know, for VR, you know, make this for the VR presentation. They'll have sort of their own views set up. And um, they'll specifically also have some of their camera visibility set up in certain ways. So, um, for example, if like railings on the project aren't needed for the walkthrough, taking those off or turning off MEP or turning off the different elements that might not necessarily be part of the conversation in VR will, will help streamline the process. Um, and then once you have this file set up, once you sort of set up your view, you set up the other uh, perspective cameras, you set up um, uh, <laughs> the, the right location of the cameras and uh, visibilities, you can finally click that VR, VR button. 
Um, and we'll give you a window right here to choose the 3D view. I have a VR master right here. This is the one that we were just talking about, the one that's open. So I'll select this. Um, and then this process is pretty fast. This is just Revit sending the file into our own format. So now at this point, um, it is no longer a Revit file. It exists in our ecosystem as an Iris VR file. If you dug into our uh, into like app data in, in the computer, you'd see that it was a .ivd. So that's our own database format where we're retaining a lot of this data um, and sort of queuing it up for a VR experience. In this window, you'll see I'm not in VR quite yet. I have a couple options. I'm going to tell it to not launch right away because I actually want to change some settings before I go into VR. I'm going to tell it to save. This will save to my library. Um, and then this is uh, Z fighting. This is if two faces are overlapping. They'll flash in VR, and it's actually really nauseating because they'll flash differently in each eye. So you're just like instantly sick. So that's pretty important to fix. Um, and this is our pass. We'll do some testing on it and make sure that it doesn't it doesn't overlap and offset it a little bit. So um, I'll usually keep this on for Revit files because it often has a lot of overlap in geometry. Um, so we'll click Start Processing. And at this point, um, this takes a couple more seconds. It'll save it to uh, the library. So here's our library. I obviously just have one file loaded. That's this one for this demo that we're giving. Um, typically, you'd have a lot more in here. And um, at this point, you could click View in VR, which would send you into a solo VR experience. This would work in the Oculus or the Vive. Um, or you could schedule a meeting and, uh, and have other people join you in it. And we'll show you the, the scheduling the meeting and going in there, because we can also show you a lot of the solo experience within that meeting experience. Um, and before I do that, this is something that a lot of people uh, don't see, because I think everyone's just sort of eager to go into VR, so they click that button right away. <laughs> it's a um, good opportunity for us to share with you guys some of the other features that we have in um, the file settings before you enter VR. So this viewpoint tab here is associated per file. So once you have a file selected in your library, you can go into viewpoints. And these are the cameras that we set up in Revit, right? So you can see these came through. Um, they're all turned on. And uh, this is, again, sort of setting up your, your narrative sequence. So these have numbers next to them. This is the sequence you'll walk through in VR. And um, I know that, for example, the solar analysis can be turned off. The section perspective can be turned off. This view can be turned off. And I'm turning all those off because um, those will leave the user sort of floating in space, like a couple hundred feet above the ground. And that's a terrible experience. And a lot of people will really panic when they see that. So I'm picking views where people are really grounded on a certain plane and uh, really feel like they're um, in a space. Yeah. Yes, so it brings them in as ordered in Revit. But uh, we do have this. Uh, UI, so you can start rearranging it. And like, I know that we'll probably want to start in the yard. We'll probably want to go into the kitchen next, and then go into the living room, and then I won't change the rest. But you can start rearranging these. We also, for most files, I mean, this is a very clean file. Obviously, we know that for most files, there's hundreds of these, so you can just turn them all off using that master button, and then selectively turn on the ones that you want. That's usually how it's used. Or you can search for viewpoints if you actually do have hundreds, which probably most of you guys do. Um, also, as you get into this, there are some uh, power user options. These are transition options. So you'll see this in VR, but as we move people between these viewpoints, um, you can decide if you want it to be a very quick hop or if you want it to be like an ease in and ease out fade. And uh, these are things that you can play around with. You'll see when we're in VR, we d have set it to fade. So there will be a nice fade in and fade out as you go between these, these views. And the last thing to highlight here is we have a few display settings. We focused a lot on design review and coordination, so we've done a little less on the rendering side. There are other tools that are excellent renderers. We're focusing on really what the schematic look and feel is and how do we make that um, really data rich. And uh, one piece of that that is really impactful in this experience is turning on outlines. That will give you a nice schematic view within Revit. And then we also do detect what glasses and give it uh, a bit of shine and, and change around the, uh, the look and feel a bit. And then the last piece here, we're in the US. Let's change it to Imperial so that our measuring tool will be proper. And uh, that will be set up to go. So now when you want to create a meeting out of this, you can go over to our Meetings tab. This is what just came out for us in 2.0. And this is pretty much inspired from GoToMeeting or Zoom, um, the idea that you have your existing project library. And then when you want to schedule a meeting, you go into this Meetings tab. You click Create a Meeting. And then um, you can pick from your library whatever file you want to have that meeting in, and then give this meeting a name. So I'm going to call this Test. 
because we actually have our colleagues joining us on another meeting that's already preset here. That's the same file. So I'll just show you this workflow, though. So we can click Next. There's my beautiful meeting setup. And then um, the steps right now, the way uh, meetings work is what we're sending online is essentially player location and voice chat. We're not sending model geometry. That's, that's both for security and it's also um, just from a technical perspective, it's easier to let you guys decide how you distribute those files. So once you schedule this meeting, you'll get uh, this format, which is a .IVM. And you'll be able to export this, save it anywhere you want on, on your computer. And then when this is saved out, you can put this on your, on, you know, your internal uh, firm's file system or put it on Box or put it on WeTransfer. And when you invite people to the meeting, just attach a link to this file. And they'll be able to drag and drop that file, and, and it'll instantly join them in the meeting. So we'll show you right at the end how you can do that sort of as a viewer tier, so you won't need an account. You can just go and put that file in and join the meeting together. So we'll walk you guys through that right at the end. Um, and now this meeting is scheduled, so this is essentially the, the meeting experience. This is the class one we set up that our colleagues are in, so I'm going to go into this one. It's the exact same file. You'll see um, that we are in here together. And uh, here they are waiting for us. So I'm in this meetings tab. I've selected this meeting. Um, I have a few other options here, but the one that really matters is this Participants tab. This shows you who else is already in the session. So we have two other folks in the session right now. And you can also change your display name because um, you'll have a little name tag on you in VR. So you can change what your name is there if you're sharing it among a couple different people. I'm going to keep it to Shane. And uh, anything else on the desktop side, Harry? Do you think I, think I got it? I think that's it. Yeah. OK, great. So we'll click Meet in VR. Before I do that, I'll make sure the Oculus is on. That's an important step. Um, yeah, we're good here. You can click launch. So once you launch into VR, it'll just show this quick loading window. Um, depending on the size of your file, it can take um, you know a few seconds to load. Um, you'll pop into the meeting, and instantly we see you know our colleagues who are in the other room, but in theory could be anywhere in the world. So you can have up to twelve people in your meeting. Um, and they're all connected via voice chat, and you can see their movements. So, uh, for example, you can see they're waving, you can see where they're pointing. Um, and so we'll kind of get more into the multi-user functionality in a second. Um, but for now, let's kind of discuss this mode that you get launched into when you start VR. Um, so we can kind of see the model you know, scale down. Um, we call this scale model mode. You'll also hear us refer to it sometimes as dollhouse mode. Um, but it gives you a really great kind of macro look at your model, which is especially you know, useful if maybe you're looking at uh, a larger area or maybe like a larger file. Um, we have a ton of really great tools that are available here. Some that we'll focus on are what we call our modify tools. So uh, on Shane's menu, he's going to click on that model interaction tab. We have two options. We have a modify model and a modify section. Um, so modify model is going to allow you to do just that. Um, you can move your model around, you can make it closer to you and, and make it bigger, and you can also rotate it. So this is great for kind of you know looking at those larger scale details, uh, especially if you're working on a larger project. Uh, you can kind of get a great look at that. You can also section your model in any orientation. Um, so once you click modify section, uh, that's going to you know put that section plane. You can rotate that vertically, horizontally, or in any direction that you want, really, uh, just by rotating your controller. Um, so say you're working on uh, like a larger skyscraper or maybe a stadium, this is a really great way to kind of uh, set up your model for actually navigating into it. Um, so one other quick tool that we'll go into kind of on the scale model mode is the uh, sun settings tool. So we actually pull in the geolocation of your model from whatever 3D modeling or software you're using, uh, and then we use that to create accurate sun lighting and shadows based on the time of day and time of year. So this is really great for doing um, you know, shadow studies in VR. You can do that as shade changes the time of day. It instantly reflects in the model. Uh, and so this is just a really quick and easy way to do that rather than you know manually doing that uh, from Reddit. So now that we've kind of went through those tools, you'll see there are a few others that are available here. Uh, but we're actually going to go through those in VR. So when Shane points into the model, there's that small yellow scale figure that appears. And then once we pull the trigger, um, we are teleported into a true scale mode where we're navigating through the model. Uh, you'll see there are a few annotations from when we were texting before. Uh, but now we're in this mode where we can navigate uh, basically throughout any of the 3D view geometry that we can hold. Um, and we can see our meeting participants are here. They're navigating to the model also. Um, so now let's take a look at some of the tools that are available in VR. 
Um, so the Shane tool does this menu. You see at the top left there is this uh, screenshot tool. So this is basically going to bring out an EPR camera. And if you pull up right to the right of that slider there, you can see uh, all of your other meetings are going to show up there, as well as your annotations and any markup that you made. So this is really great for saving all of that, uh, just as an image file, which is going to save to your desktop. And it's really great for sharing either in a presentation or a PDF. Or even just with somebody who doesn't necessarily have all of this VR hardware. Maybe there's something you want to show them. You can take a selfie. Uh, <laughs> and all of the other <laughs> and so that's the biggest to know me. Should be done now. <laughs> um, we also have a great 360 capture functionality. So some of you might be familiar with rendering out 360 panoramas using software like V-Ray or Lumion. This is a really great way to capture those panoramas in one click. Um, and you can upload those to our scope service for easy sharing or any other you know, method that you want to view those panoramas, uh, which is, again, great for somebody who doesn't necessarily have all of this hardware. They can kind of take a look at a static um, you know, viewpoint and rotate all around. Uh, so really great way to do that. The next element um, that's on that menu is the inspect elements tool. Um, so this is actually going to pull in a lot of that data from Reddit. So we can actually point at any element and select it. Um, you see that it gets outlined. Uh, and then on our menu, we're actually going to see a lot of that data information. Uh, so Shane, if you want to look at the menu, we can actually see, uh, we can see the name of the element, we can see uh, what layer it's on, materials, and also who it's selected by. So if somebody else in the meeting had selected this specific element, uh, we would see their name there. Um, and they should hear us. I think they might have their computer muted, but we actually do have voice chat and uh, headphones, um, so you can hear each other too. We just mute it during conferences because there's so much ambient noise, but yeah. uh, they um, typically, because all these devices have, have headphones, um, you do get uh, voice chat and audio as well. Oh yeah, and they can hear us. It looks like they're doing this. So there you go. Once we're in this inspect element tool, we can also use it to turn off the layer that the element is on. So say we had selected like a door or something and we wanted to turn that off, uh, our layer will show up there and we can just click on that to turn all of that off. So change can turn off all the furniture uh, and you'll see that again in the layer that will go over. Uh, another great way to use this tool is for flag elements. So once you select uh, one of those elements, you see that flag element option. Um, clicking flag element will turn the element red, but more importantly, um, it'll allow us to get some really great workflow tools after we exit VR. We'll actually be able to export a list of all of our flagged elements, as well as their Reddit element IDs and who they were flagged by, which makes it really easy to use that select by ID option in Reddit to jump to those elements. Say we found like a clash or like a you know, design issue that needs to be fixed, that makes it easy to kind of jump back there. Um, moving on to the next tool you see there, that little pencil icon is actually our markup and annotation tool. Um, so there are two main options available here. There's a brush tool and a callout tool. Um, if we go to the brush tool, we can actually use that to make uh, freehand annotations, uh, you know, mark things up in either a handheld or a projected mode. Um, so in handheld mode, you're just drawing in 3D in front of you or wherever you are. Um, you know, say you wanted to use this to denote where uh, you know certain folders would go, uh, furniture. You can use it in different colors to denote different things. So you know, maybe you assign certain colors to certain types of, of things that you want to show them. Um, you can also use it in a projected mode, in, in which case it will actually snap to whatever surface you're pointing on. Um, so that's really great for you know checking out those windows. Those look good. <laughs> um, we also recently added annotation smoothing, so now everything automatically becomes. So much for you. <laughs> um, the call tool uh, is really great for, it'll just basically do that in uh, like a circular format. So you're not freehand drawing those, they're just circles that you can modify the size and thickness for um, and, and draw annotations that way. And then of course you can also erase any of those or undo them. Um, and then you can capture these annotations using that screenshot tool, and they're also available to any other participant in your meeting. So if uh, you know if the other participants in the meeting were making annotations, we would see that, and they'll see those changes reflect on their end as well. Yeah, there you go. You got scared and erased it, but that was good. Thank you. Um, the next tool that we see there is that sun settings tool that we looked at uh, in scale model mode. It kind of works the same way here. Or actually, sorry, the measuring tool. Uh, let's throw that one. So. Um, you can obviously measure all of these distances in Revit, um, but having this measuring tool in VR is a really great way to confirm the scale of certain things. Um, so maybe we're not quite sure if this like hallway is wide enough. Um, we can use the measuring tool to really quickly get um, you know, a measurement of either the, the perpendicular distance between those two planes, or we can also draw just like a freehand measurement of, of anything that we want. Uh, especially if somebody isn't maybe familiar with the model or the client, it's really great to kind of confirm those distances. 
So now for real, the next tool is the sun settings tool. It works the same way, so um, you can just kind of change the time of day and you'll see those shadows reflect. Um, so the next tool we see there is the display settings. Uh, Shane kind of talked a bit about this in the project library. You can preset these and you can also switch them on the fly in VR. So uh, this white model mode uh, is really great also. Maybe you're still kind of in progress on your Revit model and then it's not quite ready. You can actually turn them all off and turn on outline, uh, which gives you this really nice clean look. Uh, and you can also change the time of day to that. Perfect. So let's look at that next tool on the tool palette, um, the layers tool. This is kind of similar to what we looked at uh, in the element inspection. This is a list of all of the layers that were brought in from Revit. Uh, and so we can use this to turn certain things off. Uh, like maybe you want to turn off uh, like the floor or the walls or you can look at the elements that are behind them. Uh, do that, and this also works with all of your other 3D modeling software, so we'll bring these in from Rhino and SketchUp uh, so you can get your layers there. So like in this example, the ceiling is turned off, we can see kind of into the house. Uh, the next tool we have is viewpoints. So this is um, you know what we were managing in our project library. Um, so we have a really great way to navigate throughout specific points in the model. Um, this is a pretty small house, so not necessarily as impactful, but um, if you're working with an especially large model, this is really useful for highlighting specific parts of the model that you want to learn. Um, you'll notice at the top, there's also a toggle that says bring other users along. So that's really great for our meeting. Um, you can actually kind of coordinate and bring everybody to the same location. Like we see now, it's like a flying Let's bring them up. Let's yeah. Let's let's bring them back. Let's go to um. Let's go to the kitchen. Perfect. So uh, you'll see this little kind of banner show up on the screen, and everybody's now in the same location. We can continue our productive meeting. <laughs> was that a glitch, or were they intentionally flying? They were. They were intentionally flying. There's a. So on the Oculus Rift, you can actually uh, have like smooth movement up and down. So Shane can move up and down uh, within the model. Um, perfect. So the next menu that you'll see there uh, is the participant. Oh, Harry, I'm going to jump in one one more time um, with the viewpoints. This is the order that we sequenced them before when we were dragging them around. And so you can um, go through them here in this menu, or you can use the arrow keys on the keyboard. So um, there's a couple different ways to progress through these different viewpoints. And uh, that's part of the narrative that we're talking about is you can both in VR walk through these different areas, or you can do it in... Um, Let's get to the ground again. Or you can do it on the computer as well. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Shane. So the next You're menu welcome. is uh, the participants. So this is kind of what we saw on the desktop, too, before we joined the meeting. But we see a list of all of our participants, up to 12. Um, and we have these gather and go to buttons. So gather is basically going to bring everybody to the same point that you're at, kind of similar to viewpoints. But maybe you're somewhere in the model that you haven't you know, pre-selected. You can gather everybody there. And you can also go to specific users. Um, so if somebody was at a different point in the model, we could use the go-to functionality to really quickly jump there and kind of see what that person was looking at or talking about. Yep. Um, so again, a really great way to kind of coordinate your meeting. Um, so those are some of the functions that are available in VR. Another really great tool that we have uh, is actually some desktop controls um, that are available. If you look down here at the bottom right corner, there's this little button. If I click on that, I'm going to see kind of a miniature version of the menu that Shane has on his controller on my desktop. Um, this is a really great option for having some limited control over what's happening in VR, especially uh, you know if you have a client who isn't super comfortable with the controllers or VR, you can actually just put them in the headset and control a lot of aspects of the experience for them from your desktop. Um, so for example, if I click on this viewpoints button right here, uh, I see the same viewpoints menu that Shane has on his display, and I can actually jump all of the users in the meeting to these viewpoints. Um, this way, Shane can still look around, he can look at the headset, um, he can look at specific things, but I can kind of control the experience. Um, the other options you can see available here, you have sun settings, those display settings, layers, viewpoints, of course, uh, participants, and scale model mode. So this is a really great way to kind of control the experience um, for like a client who's maybe not as comfortable using the controllers themselves. Um, great. So I think that's the main features we wanted to showcase in VR. But now that we uh, flag some of those elements, you can actually take a look here in our project library, um, and we'll see that it is on the right of all of the elements of chain flag. So you'll see there's the date um, that all of this happened. We have all of those Reddit element IDs, uh, the names of the elements. And down here, there's this button that says Export Report. Um, that's actually going to export a CSV list of all of those element IDs 
So you can just copy and paste those over to Reddit, and it'll jump you and select those specific articles for you, um, which makes it great for kind of sharing with your team. Um, in this case, Shane is the one who flagged all of these elements, but if you had other participants in the meeting, say a client or a project manager, um, it would also show you who flagged them, so you can kind of associate that to specific action items. Um, awesome. I think that this is everything that we wanted to showcase in the project library, right, Shane? Any questions on the VR stuff before we keep going? Yeah, so um, the workflow would be you can you can select that individual wall and you could flag it and then you get that list here. Um, this this flagged element tool is like the first step for us really offering element interaction. Like now we have each of these elements loaded into VR discreetly and uh, we're starting to talk a lot about like what next can we do to enhance that integration. But the first step is really just being able to tag them and be like this there's an error here, mark it up, take a picture and then have it flagged. So yeah, you can do walls, floors. Yes, absolutely. So that's coming. We are at 2.0.1 as a, a software right now, around 2.2 .2 or 2.3. Um, you'll have most of your BIM data from Revit in there. And then a little bit after that, you're going to be able to customize which data you pull through because the full, the full parameters from BIM families are insane. <laughs> and uh, we're listing all those out right now, and we're going to allow you to select which ones you can display in that inspect tool. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, that, as we've done a lot of research in this, a lot of folks are requesting that, like, yes, we can get sort of the default Revit parameters out, but they would also like the customizable parameters and be able to decide which ones are pulled through. That's a lot of the reason, I, some of you guys might have caught this, our file format is a database format, and we've built it in a way that a lot of the parametric elements of VR can really be flexible. So um, we aren't tied to a specific format or formatting for these formats. We can really be much more flexible in how we display that data in VR. Um, which is a lot of what we're working on uh, this year and next. Just a few quick slides left here. Um, so in terms of setup, uh, setup is pretty easy as long as you have tested, kind of like we talked about before. Um, the one thing to note is each participant does need their own VR-capable computer. So each one of these machines is really only capable of powering one VR headset just because of the processing power required to run that type of experience. So you'll just want to make sure that everybody that you're inviting to your meeting has that hardware ready. Um, you'll also want to just test joining the meeting um, on each of those machines just so you can make sure that the network configuration is right. Um, sometimes, especially in a corporate environment, you'll have you know, you know, certain firewall set up or proxies and we can get you all of the information that you need to make sure that those are properly set up to allow that connection. Um, you'll want to make sure that everybody has a headset with microphones and headphones. So most of the headsets have a microphone built in, and these okay. Oculus headsets there. also have headphones built in. But uh, if you have anybody joining with an HTC Vive, it's possible that they don't have an audio strap, in which case they can just plug in any set of regular headphones. Uh, but it's something to keep in mind before the meeting. We'll often have sessions where you know people aren't quite sure if there's going to be audio or not, so it's something to keep in mind. Uh, and then also just sending those set of instructions and files um, well in advance of the meeting, just so that everybody can have time to download them and make sure that they're set up uh, so there's kind of a scramble right before the meeting. Um, some quick notes on meeting etiquette. Um, we do a lot in prospect to make sure that you know the meeting runs smoothly and everything is working properly. Um, but as with in real life, uh, <laughs> there are some, you know, thoughts to have in mind. Uh, one is personal space, so not teleporting directly onto other participants or, or too close to them, just because when you're in VR, it you know, feels very real. Uh, and so having that boundary is kind of important. Uh, Resist the temptation. It's very tempting to like, when you have your colleagues in there to like start screwing with them. It, there is a personal space problem in VR, and uh, you got to leave a boundary. Uh, in terms of getting started, um, I know we went through a lot of content today. A lot of this is available on our website at irisvr.com. Um, while you're there, you can also start a free 45-day trial of Prospect and test it out with your own model, which is really kind of the best way to see you know, what type of VR workflow would work for you. Um, you can also follow us on Twitter. We post a ton of great content there. Uh, and of course, feel free to email us uh, with any 
pretty, so it will most likely really <laughs> make their way to me. Um, but we're always happy to answer questions about workflows or even um, you know, if you're having an issue with a specific file, you can send that over to us. Um, and of course, we do have a booth set up um, in the auditorium. Uh, we're doing live demos there with the multi-user functionality, so it's a great chance to ask you know, any specific questions, or even if you have a file with you that you brought, we'd be happy to you know, try to get that into VR and, and show that to you guys. Um, yeah. Okay, we can open up to questions now, and then we'll keep this running after questions to, uh, so you guys can try it as well. Yeah. So you have your nice uh, Asus ROG mm -hmm. Xfinity graphics card, and if you guys have specs for computers that you know we could run these things to digitally without being getting too sick, do you guys yeah. offer that kind of specification? For yeah, we do. Users or laptop users? Yeah, we um, we do. It's it really does come down to the GPU, and we found a few machines that run pretty reliably. Um, most of them are gaming machines, and the good news is that's a lot cheaper than workstation counterparts. Um, this machine's about $2,300, and it really is probably the best best machine for VR right now based on weight and speed. But we have a, a link in our knowledge base. Um, actually, if you just search like Iris VR recommended machine, the first article is our, we keep that updated, and we recommend uh, computer hardware there. And we have some desktop links as well, um, as well as the laptops. Yes. Yeah, on the on the polygon side, I don't have a great an I don't have a satisfying answer for you because um, the game engines that we're leveraging treat sort of polygon complexity very differently than what like Revit does. A, a great example is um, like any sort of components or families and any of these 3D tools that are repeating. Um, the the tools themselves don't count that towards any sort of polygon count. So if you're looking at file size or if you're looking at polygon complexity, if you have a lot of repeating elements that won't really show through in your Revit file or your SketchUp file or your Rhino file. Uh, in VR, that really matters. Um, so it's it's sort of hard to gauge. Even if nothing, they just keep trying to keep yes. in the Absolutely. And um, for us, for a 1080, w we can get between like 5 and 10 million polygons. Um, it's a, there's, there's lots of nuances and a lot of uh, exceptions to that. But in general, if it's like under 300 or 400 megabytes, um, you're going to have no problem. If it's above that, you might start uh, needing to section out your, your file. Um, and then you asked about the graphics, too. Um, we're pulling in Revit realistic materials right now, which is why it looks very different than the shaded view. Um, and we also don't currently have um, any RPC content. Um, so RPC content's on the roadmap. And then in terms of how we display uh, the graphics from Revit specifically, we are working on supporting shaded view, um, all the hatch patterns, the surface patterns, and then realistic view, allowing you to switch between those and also turning on and off ambient occlusion. So all those combined over the next couple of releases, you'll start seeing that really reflecting the way your Revit file looks um, in your editor itself. Yeah? <laughs> that is a very timely question. Um, we are uh, likely going to have it up either on Trello or one of those uh, roadmap boards pretty soon. We don't have a public roadmap right now. Um, we are absorbing in feature requests as much as we can, so like, please write to us if you guys have specific requests. Um, it'll go directly to the two of us, and I'm doing a lot of 2018 and 2019 roadmap planning right now, so part of that is getting a lot of the most common requests live, because we do get a lot of repeat comments that are already mapped, um, and that will make a big push around that when that's live, but we're going to have some public board pretty soon. Uh, to give you an idea, we are tethering our phone right now because the Wi-Fi in the um, in the, the phone? yeah yeah the, and it, so we can actually we've done some bandwidth testing because it's primarily uh, the location, which is just an X Y Z axis of the player, um, and then some voice data. It can almost run on dial-up. It's really low network requirements. Um, if you um, I don't recommend trying dial-up, but it's close. <laughs> um, but it is very limited. The the, the bigger issues with large firms is they have. Firewall, um, firewalls against gaming connections, and this is gaming technology, so we have some ports that we recommend opening for yeah, multi-user. Yep, and that's that's in our knowledge base as well. That's also a Google, and that's also something that we uh, post on Twitter and tweet about quite a bit as we release multi-user. Yeah. 
Great. Well, thank you guys so much. This was uh, great. Thank you for the attention. And we'll keep this running. So if you have questions afterwards and, and want to try this out, you can try it here. And then you can also try it at our booth during, uh, during the happy hour tonight. So we'll have it running then, too. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, 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 exactly. That would be really fun. Hour.